Good evening, everyone. Sorry about the technical difficulties, um, but it's really great to see everybody here on a late Friday, Monday afternoon. My name is Regan Bowden. I'm the head of global surgery and research at UCT's Surgical Society. And it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you today to our webinar entitled The Patient Journey, Perioperative Care. This webinar is co-hosted by the UCT Global Surgery Division and the UCT Surgical Society. And today we are really excited to hear from our talented and dynamic speakers as they explain to us the patient's journey through the surgical pipeline. Just a reminder again that this is part of a series. So if anyone has missed any of our previous webinars, you're more than welcome to go and find them online by searching UCT Surgical Society on YouTube. We hope that you find this evening's conversation confusing and inspiring. If you have any questions for our speakers, please do send them via the chat function to either myself or Caitlin, who will then send them to me and we'll have a Q&A session at the end of both of our speakers. Without further ado, I will now hand over to Prof Maslime to introduce our speakers for the evening. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much, Regan. Also excited about today's session. And I think many of the sessions have been looking at various aspects of surgical care, starting off with what is global surgery to what happens in theater to, you know, a lot, we've spoken about a lot of things, but today particularly, you know, the interest is really in the patient's journey and what does surgery mean to the patient? What goes, what, what, what can we do differently for the patient? So the two things that we're gonna to touch on today is how do we prepare the patient adequately for surgery so that they have a, a meaningful patient experience, you know, so that they don't walk away from this with, with all the bad memories and, and all the things that make people scared of, of coming to, to theater and make people refuse even to consent for surgery when they need it. But the other part as well, it's how can we improve the, the patient's experience and looking at things like rehabilitation, the mental health of the patient. And so looking at all of those other things that we often don't think about as surgeons. So we've got two excellent speakers today. We've got Dr. Ravi Ordit. He's a general surgeon with an interest in surgical gastroenterology laparoscopic surgery and the enhanced recovery after surgery program. He's in private practice in Cape Town. Uh, he's the perioperative lead in our global surgery team at UCT and also the African lead for the ERAS program. Ravi is, is really amazing and we love having him as part of our, of, of our global surgery team. The other speaker is Dr. Matumo Ramafikeng. She's an occupational therapist by profession. She's currently working at UCT as a senior lecturer in the Division of Occupational Therapy. And she graduated with a BSc in, in, in OT from UCT in 2003. She worked in Lesotho as an OT in mental health practice for six years before returning for UCT to pursue her postgrad studies and completed a PhD in 2018. And she's also a member of the UCT Global Surgery Steering Committee. So without wasting much time, I'm gonna hand over to, to Dr. Audit, who will start by speaking more on the clinical aspects of the perioperative journey. And thereafter, Dr. Rama, Dr. Rama Fikeng will speak. Thank you so much. Good afternoon and thank you team for the invitation and uh, yeah looking forward to this discussion we've uh, going to try and keep it as brief as possible but it's an extensive area so uh, we're happy to try and field as many questions as we can during the discussion but there's an area we both are very passionate about and hopefully you would see the value in in what we're trying to do but more importantly we're going to get you excited to get involved So if we go back to basics and look at what is perioperative care and Crocot and Associates describe this probably the best that's been in the literature for a long time. And they describe it as a patient focused multidisciplinary integrated approach to care to deliver the best possible health care throughout the perioperative journey from the moment of contemplation of surgery until full recovery. I think if you look at this, uh, if I had to add anything further to this, it would, it would be, sorry, these two things. 
the care needs to be beyond just the patient. And yes, the patient is crucial, but so is the family. And the family has to be completely on board. And the other, as surgeons, what we often forget about is the patient who fails to recover fully. And how do we support them through this? And if you look at this as at a glance, you would think, well, really, this is elementary. This is what we should be doing. This is what we're training to do. This is what we want to achieve. But actually, if you measure this, it happens in less than 15% of the time we try to provide optimal perioperative care. We very seldom work in teams. Our care is still largely surgeon-centric rather than patient-centric. And very seldom do we practice evidence-based medicine. So the slide is courtesy of Prof. Bruce Bickard, and this summarizes what traditionally happens in our care at the moment. If we look at the journey from decision to operate from the time the patient leaves hospital and recovers is usually about a year, but you know there's a whole lot that happens before surgery we're not even discussing today, and Matumo is going to talk a little bit about what happens afterwards and also in between. But typically what you would see is what happens is that we, once we've decided to operate on a patient, we then go and look for the ultra high risk patient who is then optimized, medically optimized, no other support. And they admitted the night before surgery and the decision is then made whether to proceed or cancel. In the remaining 98% of patients, we do very little. Actually, we do nothing which is quite disappointing. So the patient and the family is left to help navigate this entire time on their own, which could be weeks to months before they come to surgery. And eventually when they do come to surgery, they're seen by a team the night before, and guess what? The operation may even be canceled and they're sent off to come back a few months later. So with this approach, I think these two high studies highlight the shortcomings of this approach was the International Surgical Outcome Study and the African Surgical Outcome Study. And what these two show is that patients in low income countries and low middle income countries have poorer outcomes despite having a lower baseline risk for complications postoperatively. The ASOS study, which was led by Bruce Picard, also showed that mortality after surgery is twice the global average despite our patients being younger. And most of these patients actually die within 24 hours after surgery, which we think is, is as a result of substandard perioperative care. We see that perinatal mortality is an unacceptable 50 times higher and neonatal mortality twice that in Africa when compared to developed countries. So we start seeing a shift and the shift is towards optimization at the time of surgery being booked. And the shift has been towards correcting these key elements, which are absolutely crucial. Anemia, optimal diabetic control, hypertension, malnutrition, which refers to both undernutrition and overnutrition and cardiorespiratory fitness, and the patient's advice to stop smoking and stop alcohol for 30 days before surgery. And then the patient is left to their own devices. So if you try to picture this as what's going to happen in your clinic, a patient is going to come in who's hypertensive, diabetic, found to be overweight and anemic and booked for surgery. Happens to be smoking, so we book an appointment for the hypertension clinic, another appointment for the diabetes clinic. We may pick up the anemia and decide to correct that as it is yet another appointment for the patient. And then we ask them to stop smoking, but we don't give them any tools to help them to try and stop smoking or even impress upon why it is important to stop their smoking and the alcohol. So really what we should be doing is this, is that once we've made the decision to operate on a patient, we should be talking to the patient and the families about what can they expect after the operation? Where would they be going? Would they be coming home or not? How do they integrate into the communities? Can they get back to work or not? How do we provide the psychological support for them and the fears around financial uh, implications of the cost of surgery, but also the loss of income? And how do you engage the family? And these are still gaps that we feel that needs to be desperately uh, addressed. And by, by the development of what we believe would be well-functioning perioperative multidisciplinary clinic, 
where it can be almost a one-stop shop for the patient, where the patient can come in and all, they be, in addition to being optimized, the psychological needs and the financial needs are addressed by this team. And if you look at the access we have today to technology, a lot of this can be done remotely after the initial visit. So should not be too difficult, does not require too much of resources to do, but yet we struggle to do. And then when the patient finally comes to hospital, what we find is these gaps are still not addressed. Patient care is seldom patient-centered. We again struggling to practice evidence-based care and the care is not standardized. And we have no data. You can see across this, you need data because without data, you cannot change and you cannot manage. So if you look at the six steps in hospitals that you really require to do, again, all very simple things to do. And it's simple, irrespective of where you're working, whether you're working at a medical officer in a rural hospital, or you're working in a tertiary hospital in any specialty, these, these six steps are absolutely essential. And I'm gonna to talk to each one of these in a little bit more detail. Before, if we can get these six steps, and maybe I'll just talk to this, it's correct. What we can achieve is a reduction in this catabolic response that we see in the post-op period. And it is this catabolic response that drives the delayed recovery in patients. And if we get our perioperative care optimized, we can reduce this catabolic response and get our patients to recover sooner. So we look at the current Nilpamal guidelines for elective surgery. Currently, solids up to six hours before and clear fluids up to two hours before surgery. And this guideline has been out for almost 30 years. And if you look in the hospitals that you practice in, you'd see we still do Nilpamal from midnight. And if you tease this down a little bit more, what actually happens is the patient is in effect Nilpamal from 5 p.m. because that's when they get served dinner. After that, there's nothing to eat or drink. And you'll recall the number of times a patient is booked on the list only to be canceled late the next day. And they may then go 48 hours with very little to eat or drink. When you look, off, look at the current guidelines of the elective colorectal surgery, we see there's no benefit for routine nasogastric tube. We still use them. We don't need to wait for patients to pass stools and platers because ILS very seldom occurs and we should be able to feed our patients from day one. And if we can do that, what effectively we are able to achieve is convert the patient from a starved state to a fed state. And we can convert to a fed state, we can reduce the catabolic response. And by reducing the catabolic response, you can improve outcomes. But to be able to do that, we got to be able to communicate this. And a typical example, when we started with this program, it took us about a year to convince the nursing staff to allow patients to eat and drink. So we would have the patient who's fully informed and wanting to eat and drink by being stopped by the nursing team. But there's also surgeons that are reluctant to feed the patients because they're concerned that the patient's gonna vomit and may undo the surgical operation. But in addition to communication, you're not going to get a patient eating and drinking well if they're nauseous or they're vomiting. And how often do we pay attention to adequate prophylaxis? Almost never. We think about surgical site, we think about DVT, but we seldom think about prophylaxis for nausea and vomiting. And then in pain control's got to be optimized. If a patient is pain, in pain, they're not going to eat and drink. And if you look at pain management, we remain too dependent on opioids and epidural analgesia, and they are very effective, they're cheap, and, and that's what we use throughout most of Africa, in fact. But we forget about its side effects, nausea, vomiting, sedation, again, driving the catabolic response and delaying patient recovery. So there's lots of options. And over the years, we can see that the whole shift is towards using a multimodal tailored approach to, to analgesia. So let's work out what this patient needs. But you can't do this with a five minute pre-anesthetic consult before the patient goes to sleep. This requires a formal consultation at the prehab clinic to be able to optimize uh, pain control. 
And the same with fluids. We, we use IV fluids fairly liberally, but if you look at this, we know that there's actually a very fine, narrow margin in which we can achieve the ideal fluid balance and that too much of fluid or too little fluid is detrimental to patient outcomes. And if we get it right, this is what we should be able to do. This patient has had a laparoscopic resection of her rectum uh, the day before. The next day, she's sitting out of bed. She's got an IV access point, no fluids. She's eating and drinking. That's what we should be aiming towards. And as you know, this is one of my pet hates is intravenous fluids. I think a simple way to remember this, it's a drug. In fact, it's the commonest prescribed drug on the planet. And there is no ideal fluid. So the less we use, the better. And again, a reminder that if you're using normal saline, it's anything but normal saline. And one liter of this has got the equivalent amount of salt in 60 packets of crisps. And if you want to look up fluid management, that's beautifully written and uh, this document by Dilip Lobo on called the basic concepts of fluid management is available online free of charge. It's a very easy read and well illustrated. So what we believe is that if we can get the pre-op clinic working well, we can get a perioperative MDT and everyone communicating well, identifying their roles, talking to each other, we can achieve better outcomes. But you can't do this if you don't change the service delivery platform that we use, because it's just impossible. Change is difficult. We get stuck in dogmas. We've been doing the same thing for more than 100 years. We expect a different outcome. How do you change? So you need to change the whole platform. And there's a few programs currently addressing this. And I've been in, involved with the ERS program for the last 10 years. And the biggest attraction for me is that it addresses all the gaps that we currently face in perioperative care. So you've got guidelines that's developed by the profession. They have an established implementation program so that it can affect change. And then a database that's real time web-based that allows teams to measure what they're doing, monitor their compliance to the guidelines. So are you actually doing what you think you're doing and measure your outcomes? and to use the standard to affect any ongoing change that may be needed. So currently there are over 130 hospitals around the world in 20 countries, and you would see that uh, very little presence in low middle income countries. And we have two centers in Africa, and I'll come to that shortly. But if you look at the data of ERAS in colorectal surgery, it's very compelling. The so reduction of length of stay by 25 to 50%, complications by similar number, cost savings of between 10 and 20%. And a recent study done from the Canadian group in Alberta showed that for every $1 invested in a program, you can save $4 downstream. Recent work showing that this increased five-year cancer survival. And contrary to popular belief that nursing workload is actually improved and patients and staff are much happier with the program. So we implemented this across three hospitals, five teams in 2015 in the private sector, 450 patients and our median length of stay is five days. We compared this to a thousand, just over a thousand patients in 2017 nationally and the length of stay was almost double that. So when we talk to value-based care and, solve, and try to solve the healthcare problem, we go back to basic concept and talk to value and what is value. And if you want to improve care and improve value for the patient, there's two simple ways to do it. You've got to improve the outcomes and reduce the cost of delivery. And programs like ERAS does both. So just to illustrate what can be achieved, this gentleman is 72 years old, hypertensive, got ischemic heart disease, and he had a laparoscopic resection of his left colon and his rectum. And this is him day one heading home. <laughs> it, it's quite remarkable. If you told me this 10 years ago that we'd be able to achieve this, I would, I would have said, you're absolutely crazy. And this is what you're likely to see in most hospitals around the world. A patient with that sort of operation would be lying in bed and with the nasogastric tube still in place, catheter in place, foot pumps, 
and lying in bed. So we implemented the same sort of program in the colorectal film at Crotus Gear. And you look at the start, we measure what we were doing. There was a lot of debate whether we needed it. But when we looked at what we were doing, we actually were doing it right in less than a third of patients. Post implementation, we've got 250 patients. We've doubled our compliance with guidelines and I have already seen a shift in the length of stay. We did a similar program in the trauma unit and again, a significant decrease in length of stay. So clearly, if we can get these kind of results in other centers in Africa, and then these types of programs can offer the opportunity for patient-centered cost-effective change at scale rapidly, and it could assist in addressing this huge unmet surgical need in low middle income countries. And really within the division uh, uh, of UCT is, is for us to form perioperative teams to facilitate training, research and implementation of innovative locally relevant MDTs to improve service delivery platforms for perioperative care. And what we'd like to see is other global surgery units on the continent to start adopting the same lead in developing leads for perioperative care, but also for the surgical student societies to start getting involved in this because we need the people to drive this. And it is an area which is in desperate need of, of hands-on to, to make this happen. And I think it's a fantastic opportunity to make a difference to patient care on the global surgery platform. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Oded, for the really good presentation. I'm sure we'll be building quite a few questions about that. Um, I have a few of my own that, that I would like to ask too. Um, but before that, we'd just love to welcome uh, Dr. Rama Fakeng if she's ready to start presenting for us, that'd be amazing. Um, thanks, Regan. Um, let me just set myself up nicely here. There we go. Evening, everyone, and... Thank you for, for the invite. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be talking to future surgeons and I hope we'll plant seeds today that will last a lifetime. Uh, as Dr. Audit has indicated in the definition of uh, perioperative care, it is very important that it's patient focused. So I am going to spend quite some time a, giving some of the tips or questions that we could include in preparing for surgery, uh, which might be useful for making our practice a lot more patient focused. So first of all, uh, Dr. Audit has already highlighted that the multidisciplinary team doesn't quite work well together, although it exists. Uh, that's a huge gap because as his uh, pathway showed, sometimes the patient only, the consultation happens when surgery is recommended and on the day before, which is quite a short amount of time. And in between, I think there's consultations that need to happen with the patient and the family to ensure that everyone is on board in terms of the need for surgery. So first and foremost, we need to consider who this patient is, who is this person before the surgery. Why this is important is because without that information, there's, likely, there's a likelihood of making decisions that are not quite patient-centered. And there's a lot of variables that impact even the choice to consent to surgery, which sometimes I know that we struggle with where as health professionals, we think surgery is the solution and the patient is a bit reluctant. And I'm sure you'll come across that in your careers. And uh, some of the elements that are important to consider are elements of diversity. We talk about diversity a lot, uh, especially for countries like South Africa. 
and many other low and middle income countries. Diversity is a huge issue, but sometimes we don't bring it into perspective when it comes to such decisions as whether to consent to surgery or not. And it's important because among others, when we look at language, in preparing the patient for surgery, as well as the families. And we, the, the, the Western model of care is so individualistic that we tend to forget the, the family, which plays a huge role in whether a person will decide to uh, consent to surgery or not. If we look at language, we have a lot of our majority of the population, their literacy levels are quite low. We know that. And we have quite a number of languages in South Africa. Sometimes you come across a patient who doesn't speak uh, English or the language of practice, if I can call it that, so well. Therefore, even asking them whether they have questions about surgery doesn't quite make much of an impact because they'll either say yes, so that the conversation stops because they don't quite understand that, but that doesn't mean they understand what the surgery and the implications of it are. So language is a huge one. And in addition to that, the nationality of the person is very important. And many of uh, our African countries are hosting many people that are on a refugee status that complicates their access to health care. And sometimes when we don't ask about their nationality and their status, we miss that part, uh, which is very important because they may or may not make it to that appointment for surgery. There's other factors such as religion. We have come across maybe some cases where some people for religious reasons can either consent to surgery or not, or blood transfusion or not. And gaining perspective of who this person is, particularly considering diversity, elements of diversity is quite important. And among others, these that are depicted here are not the only considerations. The other ones are quite obvious because it forms part of the demographic data that you collect uh, as, as doctors. And I just want to add that there's limited time that we spend, especially for people that rely on the public health sector. There's such little time that as health professionals, we spend with the patients because of the workload. Therefore, sometimes we need to actually refer to members of the multidisciplinary team who can do a lot more detailed history taking and occupational history among others to give feedback on who this person is before they go into surgery and how surgery is likely to affect their lives. We need to also consider the socioeconomic status because surgery isn't as affordable as we would like it to be. So, and the socioeconomic status also speaks to whether during incapacitation, the person will be able to earn a living or not, or how much it will actually cost the family to sustain this person while they are not a, while they are in recovery and in rehabilitation. I also want to bring an important point uh, across that rehabilitation is also quite expensive. And in South Africa in particular, more people, you'll see the stats later, more people don't even have access to rehabilitation services, which means post-surgery, people are likely to, their impairments are likely to develop into a disability just because they didn't have access to rehabilitation. And as part of a collective, so here I mean this person is part of a family. What is it that the family thinks and feels about surgery? Because, and how will the family be impacted? Sometimes we, uh, we come across cases where the family is more adamant about surgery. And in some cultures and some religions, 
the person that's receiving surgery sometimes is not even the one to decide whether they want surgery or not. It's up to the rest of the family, the elders in the family. And when we don't uh, consider the fact that this person is an individual, perhaps within their cultural background, doesn't have the capacity to consent to surgery or ask certain questions about surgery, we miss a very important uh, element of family. And we need to consider what the roles of this person are. And I'll touch on that in the next slide. But coming back to the understanding of disease and need for surgery, we know that particularly for South Africa and many other countries, that the understanding of health and disease from a cultural perspective, sometimes is actually much stronger than the Western understanding of health and disease. So for instance, if someone, if a particular illness is perceived by the patient and the family as maybe a curse, the outcomes of surgery for that particular person will differ considerably from if the person perceived this as from a Western perspective where it's, I, I felt sick and this is what needs to be done. This is because depending on our different understandings, there are different explanations for the course of our lives, which then will impact on the surgical outcomes. Sometimes we might find that due to whether it's socioeconomic status or the different roles that the person plays, in the, especially in the family, they might not regard surgery as that important at that particular time. And this can cause quite a bit of frustration when people delay getting surgery because then it means we're heading for perhaps surgery that's much more costly and quite big, whereas it could have been avoided if they gained access to surgery or consented to surgery a lot earlier. There's also another element that I want to bring to your attention that sometimes we also need to explore, especially when people are quite resistant to surgery or even the recovery process, whether there's actually a benefit to not following through with the recovery or rehabilitation process or even getting surgery to start with. It might sound absurd, but um, there are some benefits to going counter what we know as health professionals. Um, we also need to consider where the person lives, where they work, where they play, and where they socialize. These are questions that perhaps as surgeons, uh, you're not quite attuned to asking, maybe, I'm assuming, but other health professionals within the multidisciplinary team, these are our specialty. We need to know, particularly, for instance, for us as occupational therapists, we need to know who this person is as an occupational being, which means we'll have to ask about where they live, they work, they play, and they socialize. So all of those aspects, we need to have an idea of how they perform in those areas. Because uh, when deciding on even the type of surgery or the recovery process or the agency of surgery, Knowing all of this background information helps us as health professionals to decide on the best course of action. And it says to the patient that we care enough to want to know more about them and start preparing the patient, even psychologically, on the impact of surgery on all of these different areas that I've mentioned here. The mental status of the patient at the time is very important because uh, it impacts this quite a substantial literature or that shows how recovery is impacted by the mental status of the patient. And it's important to keep that in check because sometimes due to a surgery and especially if we look at, um, let me think, maybe surgeries such as amputations, that loss of a limb uh, can be quite significant on the person's uh, mental health because of how they now see themselves. So it's important to keep that in check. 
And considering that uh, depression uh, is very, we are all prone to depression at some point, and there's quite a high incidence of depression among people, the population in general, in low and middle income countries, most of it that's not diagnosed. So you can imagine if we don't keep that in check, especially when someone is dealing with um, the outcomes of a surgery, then we might miss the fact that this person has perhaps slipped into depression. So checking the mental status before and after surgery and during recovery is quite important. There's also the perceptions and attitudes of the social context. And especially if we're looking at surgery that's going to result in an impairment, there's still a whole lot of stigma about disability. And that's not my mic. And uh, we need to prepare the person in totality, holistically, to, to also hear them out in terms of how their community or their family uh, views disability, because surgery can likely result in disability or death even. So for them to prepare for that is a part of the role of the multidisciplinary team. We also need to consider how the surgery will impact the person after they, they have gone through surgery in terms of their function and their quality of life. When we look at function is their ability to continue to perhaps do life every day. And sometimes for perhaps a number of days or weeks, but we've seen uh, with what Dr. Audit has presented that if we follow a certain pathway, like the ERAS one, people are likely to get back to function much quicker than if uh, those pathways are not followed, which means the sooner they recover, then the better their quality of life. And following surgery, then there's recovery and rehabilitation. Sometimes, uh, when we look at our referral pathways, particularly in the primary health care sector in South Africa, uh, sometimes patients get lost in between. You see from tertiary to uh, district to primary, then sometimes referrals don't happen as they're supposed to. And people miss even what's written on their note because perhaps they can't read it themselves and doctors tend to write in a very fancy way. And so people tend to miss that they have to come back for appointments and then they don't rock up for follow-ups. And we misconstrue some of the reasons whereas if referral pathways were clearer and were effective between the primary healthcare settings all the way up to the tertiary, uh, it would be easy to follow up on patients. However, I am mindful that due to shortage, maybe or maybe not, that wouldn't be as easy, but it will certainly improve to a, to a certain extent. The goals of recovery and rehabilitation have to be negotiated with the patient because if we don't get their buy-in, that's where they'll come for one session and look at what we're doing as useless and then they don't come back again. And as the multidisciplinary team, based on the hierarchy that we still work within in terms of our system as health professionals, we rely very much on the surgeons and the doctors re-emphasizing the importance of rehabilitation to the patients. And when we don't do that, then they take it as optional. And when they know before they go into surgery that that's the process that can get them back to optimal function, then it's easier to buy into, into that process. Also bearing in mind that there are also benefits of not recovering. So this then, if I'm to just paint a picture of the WHO rehab facts, rehab is a largely unmet need. 50% uh, of people in low and middle income countries do not access the rehab that they need. And when the stats look like this, I need us to understand that this means that those people that don't get rehabilitation 
then probably end up with a disability that could have been avoided. And in South Africa, it's even worse. So if we look at 80% of the population that depends on the public health sector, and this is important because this means affordability and everything else that's associated with being able to afford to get treatment elsewhere, they can't. So they definitely depend on the public health sector. And there's only six to 20% of rehab services in primary health care settings. So we can already see that a large number of people that perhaps need rehabilitation don't eventually get to be rehabilitated. Hence, perhaps the increase in the number of people that stay on the disability grant when they started off as on the temporary disability grant. And it's said that despite the re-engineering public health, uh, primary health care policy framework, rehab needs are still not met. So in summary, um, I tried as much as possible to speak for the shortest time available. Uh, disability diversity is a key consideration in perioperative care and improved collaboration among healthcare workers is needed when providing perioperative care that is patient-centered. And we still need to consider rehab as an issue of equity and diversity because without rehabilitation, then the surgical outcomes are also largely impacted. And lastly, I want to say, perhaps uh, there's a need for more interprofessional education among health sciences students, because the biggest impediment of referral is that we don't know what each other does. So we don't know when to refer, and then the referral pathways are not well established. So perhaps starting with a, an increase in interprofessional education can get us as students to start working together and seeing all the speech and language pathologists also train people on soloing. Oh, okay, the OTs do this, the physios do that. And then perhaps when you now in practice, you can even start advocating for some of those services because there's a huge shortage of rehabilitation professionals in our health services. And as health professionals, this is my final uh, comment. We need to be mindful that when we interact with patients, there's an intersection of beliefs, both ours as health professionals, as well as the beliefs of the person accessing care. And if we are uncomfortable with difference, then we won't consider issues of diversity which shape whether the care we provide is patient-centered and value-based or not. And that's it from me for today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rama Fakeng, for that presentation. I mean, I think it's particularly pertinent how you spoke about rehab care being a very important issue of equity, um, especially in our context. So I really appreciate that. And I think the first question that I'm gonna start off with sort of speaks to that, and it's for both Dr. Urit and Dr. Rama Fakeng. Um, so it sort of speaks about, um, Dr. Urit mentioned a multidisciplinary team that's providing like this preoperative care, maybe in a clinic setting. Um, what is the uptake of this in both the public and private sector? And how does that actually change outcomes of patients? And what are potential next steps to increase this sort of service um, especially in the public sector. I don't know if both of you want to speak to that question. Dr. Olid. <laughs> so I think what we think, well, to answer the question about benefit, yes, it's very difficult to measure the benefits of individual elements of care. But what we are seeing is that the more components of the care that uh, the more compliant we are with different elements of the care, the better the patient outcomes is. And that's coming through consistently in the data. The, the question in the, there are different challenges in the private and the public sector. And uh, so in, in the public sector, you, we tend to find that these clinics either don't exist 
or the conversation is only starting in, in, in the establishment of these clinics. And invariably, it is the logistics and the resources. And in the private sector, it is particularly fragmented. And, and so, but what happens and what, what we've been able to do both at Crudisque and in the private sector is that a lot of the teams have been semi-virtual teams. So you create the teams, but the meetings are held on a virtual platform. It may be a video conference, it may be a teleconference. And, and we find that the needs are different and Matema highlights these things. And we would find that, for example, in the private sector, the patient goes home having spent time explaining everything, but they actually remember very little. And next thing they're on the internet, or you're getting calls from the daughter in Australia and the son in London, all wanting an explanation. And, and it's a simple means of just communication. If we, so what we've done is created a summary that the patient gets when they leave the room of what the diagnosis is, what the uh, treatment plan is, what the expected post of course is, and what are the potential complications. Simple, easy, they can send it off to whoever they want. Now you translate that into the public sector, it's a little bit more tricky because levels of care is different, but also there's the language and education barriers. And that's where you need the team to start embracing it. And that's one of the key tasks within the global surgery perioperative team is to look at that and see how we can take that forward. So we need help in short. The next question sort of follows on with that and speaks directly to you, Dr. Ramafer King. Um, it starts off by saying that OTs and other rehab health professionals are often only consulted after the surgery has taken place. What is your experience at Hrutske or UCT with this? And is there a precedent for pre-operative involvement of health professionals in your experience? So I must say I largely practiced uh, in Lesotho and not much in South Africa, but from observation and uh, collaboration with, uh, with, with our my fellow colleagues, the, the observation is actually right. We only, rehab is only consulted after surgery. So there's a huge gap, which is why I was highlighting, I framed my presentation in this manner. There's a huge gap where the rehab professionals don't quite make up the team that prepares the person for surgery, unless the person came in and was receiving rehab already, and then a decision is made for surgery to be an option, then perhaps they'll get involved because then the, the kind of uh, relationship that they form with the rehab team is slightly different from what they have with the doctors. We tend to spend longer so we get all the inside scoops. So that that is a huge gap. And seeing that uh, Dr. Audit, um, uh, has reported that Iris is working. I'm actually wanting to approach him and challenging on how the rehab professionals can make part of, can be part of the team that prepares people for surgery because I'm not sure even whether the psychologists are involved because when you look at something that's life changing or life altering, the person needs to be in the right frame of mind to receive the news. And it takes time to actually go through the stages of grief that I'm going to lose a limb, for instance, or I need this surgery and after this, I really need to change my lifestyle. Then it takes quite some time and it's true. We, don't, we are not part of the team that prepares for surgery. Yeah, and I think having the informed patient is absolutely crucial because the patient needs to actively participate in their recovery. And if you haven't set clear guidelines on what we expect of them and what they can expect from us in hospital, you're left with a very anxious and underprepared patient. So a lot of the work is preparing the patient for the surgery before you even come to surgery. And part of that work is the concept of prehabilitation. So the belief is that if we can prehabilitate, then we need to do less rehabilitation at the end. Because even if the patient complicates, they are prepared for that. The problem is that given our limited resources, 
you've got to start slowly. And, and so simply to get a dietitian into the team is when nutrition is a huge problem, is near impossible. And then we started with colorectal and you're gonna be doing a stoma on a patient and a patient has got no idea what a stoma looks like, what a stoma bag is like. And you send a patient home who's living in a township to go and empty a stoma bag. How do you do this? And nobody has that conversation until after the operation. So can you imagine the anxiety that this patient and the family face for months until they come in for the surgery? And then we start addressing it. So, you know, we're gonna, we got to start working on this. And I think the key is that we start slowly and we build and we started with colorectal and we've made progress. I think we'll be talking about crudiscue, but then we bring the other disciplines in and then hopefully we create the footprint for other units to be able to use around the country and even across the continent. And a lot of this, actually what we've learned from COVID actually, is that we can do this via telephone or via a web-based consultation. And we know that in Africa, cell phone usage is 120%. So it's easy enough to contact a patient and to be able to have this kind of conversation. We don't need to bring them in to multiple visits to a clinic, which you can't afford to get to. Amazing, I think that was a very thorough answer. Thank you, both of you. Um, I think the next one speaks also a lot to this. There's clearly a lot of difficult conversations that have to happen with families and with patients, um, both before and after surgeries. We don't get much teaching on this. Uh, do you guys have any tips of how we can have these conversations fruitfully um, in a way that benefits patients and their families? So again, I think you touched on a very important point. And uh, when I was training, which was a little while ago, uh, as the student and the houseman, we had to take consent for the patient for surgery. Now, for heaven's sake, why the student? How can you really get informed consent when you as a student barely know what actually the procedure entails? Forget about what the recovery is. And I would bet that in most places, very little of that has changed. And the, the conversation needs to happen at both undergraduate and postgraduate training. Perioperative care needs to be highlighted into the academic program so that we can have this kind of conversations and how to communicate. And, and that's uh, on Salome's and my task is, uh, Salome actually had a meeting a month ago or so with, with, the, with the deanery to look at how we address this because I think that's a huge gap. And if you look at perioperative care, you know, we, we, we get taught of these things in when we do neurosurgery and maybe a bit of general surgery and maybe a bit of obstetrics, but there's no single factor that's linking all of this together. And that's what it should be. It needs to be a standalone session during our undergraduate training and postgraduate training to, to, to acquire these skills. I absolutely agree. And I just need to remind your students that, uh, especially in South Africa, that since the students um, actively advocated for certain changes in curriculum, this is one of the things that you can bring up because I don't think issues of equity and diversity are dealt with that well in our, and especially in the undergrad programs, because I think that's where the, may, the biggest change and shift can be. Among ourselves, among yourselves as students, you're still not very comfortable with the difference, even among your classmates. So if we're not comfortable with differences that exist within you as a body of students, then with someone who's less educated and you're in a position of power, even in, I mean, even conversations like that, when I talk about a position of power and how it tips the scales and equity and diversity seem to just not be in your radar. But these are some of the things you can advocate for. And uh, as I indicated, a, a bit more interprofessional teaching, not only at the level of BP and BHP, but in the clinical years, when you see how each other work as health professionals, you start getting gaining a bit of insight. And I'm not saying it will prepare you enough to be able to have some of the difficult conversations 
but you start seeing how others practice and perhaps learning and seeing that it's possible. So, yes. Yeah. I also just wanna add, you know, I mean, and we seeing this a lot with these conversations that we keep having that these are not nice to know things. These are things that need to be part of the curriculum that need to be taught. And as global surgery has been evolving and we've been see, you know, saying things that we've previously haven't spoken about, understanding the global burden of disease, understanding how patients should be treated, thinking about the mental health of uh, mental wellness, bringing rehabilitation. So this just emphasizes that these, this needs to be part of the curriculum and not just a nice to know, but it needs to be fitted back into the curriculum so that you learn these things as, as medical students, as aspiring surgeons, et cetera. Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Ramaphakang raised a very important point. We have a lot of our colleagues in the health sciences are much better trained to have these conversations. Um, we never get to learn with them or learn from them um, on how to do it in the correct ways. So I, I think that's a really valuable point. And thank you, Prof, for um, speaking about this to the deanery. We appreciate that. Um, I'm wondering if we have time for one more question or if I should hand over one more question. Okay, Dr. Ramafakang then, uh, you spoke a bit about how, you know, there might be a bit of an incentive for patients to not recover fully. Um, maybe there's a disability grant that's offering being offered to them. How do we sort of manage the situation? Um, and how do we ensure that patients are motivated to recover and to recover well um, after their surgeries? Um, the, whew, that area is complicated by our economic status in the country. When you look at the unemployment rate, and sometimes we don't think unemployment actually has an implication on health outcomes, but it does, a direct one, because if people have access to a disability grant, then they will rather stay on it for longer, which then demotivates them from a being recovering because there's no other source of uh, employment. So, when working with a person like that, referral to, among others, OT, we explore, we have a, an area of our practice called work practice. That's where we explore with the person different avenues. If you used to work as, a, let's say you had what? An, you were a laborer and have an above elbow amputation. You can't because most of your work is physical. So then we explore other interest areas and what it is you can do with that level of impairment. But without the referral, that then if the working collaboratively, then can perhaps motivate the person to work towards getting alternative employment, which will then they can only do if they recover. So that collaboration and working interprofessionally also comes in there. Amazing. Thank you to both of our presenters and to Prof. Nasime for your valuable input too. I think that was a really important discussion. Um, and from some of the stats that Dr. Uedit showed us, um, and definitely from some of the conversations Dr. Ramafaking introduced to us, it's very clear that this is an imperative. As Prof. Nasime said, this is need to know information. Um, and I'm really excited that we were, had an opportunity to hear from two really well-learned individuals on these topics. I'm really grateful for your time. I'm gonna hand over to Prof. Maswime now, um, who will continue. Right. Thank you so much to, to, to both of you, uh, Dr. Ramafiking and, and Dr. Audit for, for excellent talks. I think this is practical, real, what is global surgery in action? How, how do we improve surgical case, surgical outcomes? And I can look back to my own experiences, you know, in, in, in surgical worlds in, in obstetrics and gynae, being the person that admits the patient who's, for example, come for a hysterectomy to me. And all I'm thinking about is we need to optimize this patient, operate on her, keep her for three days and send her back home. But the whole transdisciplinary care, the whole let, the work, let's work together to improve patient outcomes, to, to reduce the, disease, uh, the burden of disease. What happens to the patient in between 
you know, the time that we discharge her and the six weeks when she comes back for a follow-up visit. And so this has been all extremely practical because like Ravi said, it's not just about putting up another IV line. We need to think about what we do and, and, and how we do it and to understand uh, the patient in the context of where they come from, the family that they are part of. And I think most importantly from this talk is, is the patient-centered approach, the person-centered approach. So many elective cases uh, are booked on the availability of the surgeon. They are booked on what the you know what the surgeon thinks needs to be done for the patient, and not so much what what is feasible for the patient, what the patient prefers, what they understand. And so I think I, I really appreciate the idea of us moving away from the surgeon centric approach to the patient centered approach. And uh, I also liked a lot uh, what Dr. Ramafikin said about understanding our differences, you know, and understanding that first of all, the patient comes from a different space. As clinicians, we are working, uh, we are different from each other, not just the diversity in how we look, but how we think in our training and working as part of a team that brings different things, uh, different parts, uh, you know, of the, of, of the puzzle together, working with the rehab specialists, working with the nurses, working together to improve patient outcomes together. So thank you for, for this. And I mean, for the students, I think we've, you've all learned a lot today. And this is stuff, it's gonna be on, 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 the, on our webpage, on the YouTube page, and I'll really encourage that you tell others about this and let them listen and learn as well. So in closing, I'm gonna hand over to, to, to Savannah. Uh, once again, thanking you Savannah for being an amazing president, uh, Sech Sok, and, and handing over to you so that you can formally hand over to, to Katie. Thank you. And thank you, Regan, again, for always being an amazing host. Thank you. Thank you, Fafasime, and good evening, everyone. Unfortunately, some of the committee and subcommittee members weren't able to make it this evening. I know it's a very busy time of the year, but for those of you who are on this call and do feel comfortable, please turn your cameras on now so that everyone can see the driving force behind the 2019-2020 team. So as many of you know, the new executives for 2020-2021 were officially elected at the end of September at our annual general meeting. And although we have already handed over officially, I just wanted to take this opportunity to publicly thank a number of people who have really played an integral role in the success of our events this year. So first and foremost, I would like to thank my executive team, Sipo Andrea, the Vice President External, and Isabel Kim, the Vice President Internal, for their support, time, and hard work this year. Your commitment and dedication to serving our society has been greatly appreciated, and I've thoroughly enjoyed working alongside both of you. So thank you for a really successful and productive year, and I wish you both all the best in your future leadership endeavors. I would also like to once again thank the committee members for their hard work and perseverance this year, despite the obstacles brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic and the challenge of having to put all our events online. And I commend each of you for your ingenuity and flexibility in your approach to your portfolios and events. So thank you to Alana Williams, our Head of Social Events and Outreach, Isma Baldi and Imran Majit, our Head and Deputy Head of Career Development, Jandre Malherba, our Head of Talks, Caitlin Pai, our Head of Media and Marketing, Kelsey Besta, our Secretary, Renee Zinn, our Treasurer, Regan Bowden, our Head of Global Surgery and Research, Yejin Jang, our Head of Anatomy Workshops, Ziyang He, our Head of uh, Surgical Skills Workshops. Each and every committee member has really played an integral role in the success of this year. And I think we can definitely be proud of what we've managed to achieve together as a team. A special thank you also goes out to our subcommittee members who have really served so graciously and diligently behind the scenes this year. So thank you to the Career Development Subcommittee, Gabby Leong, Jumisa Mbande and Fumi Afoleyan, our Skills Workshop Subcommittee, Harry Kim, and then our Social Events and Outreach Subcommittee, Fumzile Mukari and Shavara Naidu. Your input and hard work has definitely not gone unnoticed and your contribution has really been invaluable. So thank you to all of you. However, none of this would have been possible without the support of our Surgical Society members. So on behalf of the committee and myself, I would like to thank you for your ongoing support this year. And although our events did look a little different with our online platform, we really hope that you found the content and events interesting, engaging and insightful. 
Finally, once again, I just wanted to say congratulations to the new incoming president, Hayton Pai, the vice president internal, Ye Jin Jang, and the vice president external, Regan Bowden, for being elected onto the executive committee for 2020-2021. The committee and I would like to wish you and your soon to be elected committee everything of the best for this coming year. I am now going to hand over one last time to Caitlin Pai, the president of the UCT Surgical Society to close the talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Savannah. And thank you also to Sipo Ndurea and Isabel Kim too. You guys have made a phenomenal and supportive team. And it's clear that you have given your all to the society this year. So thank you so much for that. I'm so honored to be taking over as president for 2021. And I'm especially excited to be doing it with Regan Bowden, the incoming vice president external and Yejin Jang, the incoming vice president internal. I think I speak for all three of us when I say that we can't wait for what 2021 has in store. And I hope to serve the society in a way that upholds the principles of our vision, which is to be an inclusive society that embraces innovation and reflects transformation. To the whole 2020 committee, I hope we can continue to propel the legacy that you have set in motion. And thank you for setting up such a strong foundation for us to build on. And lastly, a thank you to both our incredible speakers, Dr. Ramafi King and Dr. Udit, and to Regan and Prof. Naswima for yet another awesome and engaging talk of the series. And of course, thank you to everyone who attended today. I hope you've, um, and for also supporting the whole series. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And please do join us for the finale of the Global Surgery Talk com uh, series coming up soon this week, uh, not this week, this month. Um, Keep an eye out on our social media pages for when that will be and for more details. So thank you again to everyone and I hope you have an awesome evening. Bye.